investigate and trying to support and give artists tools, both in Romania and in other places, uh, towards uh, entrepreneurship and how to better organize themselves, how to better uh, gain access to certain resources, um, also get inspiration and start new collaborations. Um, I don't know if there is something else that I forgot, but I think um, as a very brief introduction, Sorry, I think we lost Christina for um, briefly there. But I think we'll just um, pass on the, the mantle. Sorry, Christina, I think you fell out for a short bit there. Shall we? Um... Oh, there she's gone. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, Stefan, um, I will give you um, the floor for the next uh, about 40, 45 minutes. Um, Stefan is the chair of um, Young Artist Society in, um, in Norway, um, but also an artist, as most people working in the arts, possibly apart from me, are. So Stefan, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aslak, and, and thanks, Christina. Hope you managed to stay on. Of course, there's always the recording after. Um, so this webinar has the ambitious title, Understanding the Norwegian Art Scene. And I feel that there's some need for uh, a bit of expectation management here for at the beginning, um, because contemporary art in Norway is a very broad topic and it has deep roots in the local history and a lot of connections to Norwegian society and um, and local politics. So I hope to be able to, to uh, give you some understanding from this presentation, but I think what uh, I feel is important to stress here at the beginning that this is uh, my understanding of uh, the Norwegian art scene. So just as a way of uh, getting started on the road to understanding here, um, we should get to know each other a bit better or uh, since this is mainly one-way communication through the screen, um, I'll tell you a bit about myself. And there'll be some space for questions later in the, in the break and after the presentation. And then you'll be welcome to present yourself if, uh, if you want to. Um, my name is Stefan Honlöken and I'm an artist. And I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation here for you. So this is um, maybe a way to situate myself in art history already with these presentations. Let's see if I can uh, make this work. Here's my name and here's Unge Kunstneres Samfunn or Young Artist Society. And, and as for the past two and a half years, I've been uh, chair of UKS or Unge Kunstnere Samfunn. Um, this is an artist organization that has close to 700 members across Norway. And I lead the board, which is made up of, uh, of artists who are elected by the members. And uh, the board is in charge of the political work on behalf of the members. And we're also responsible for the UKS exhibition space, which is uh, located in Oslo. And uh, it's directed by Miriam Bistreich and a wonderful team. And it's set to reopen after relocating um, on January the 13th. So you're all warmly welcome to UKS in Oslo, if you can make it on Friday the 13th, no less. And I'll tell you more about UKS in, uh, in, uh, in a bit, but uh, I want to talk a bit about me first. Um, I studied art in Oslo at uh, the what was formerly the School of Applied Art uh, and which has since become part of the larger National Academy of the Arts. And um, this merger into the larger academy 
was the reason that the study program that I entered, um, which had their wonderful name, the Institute for Color, was uh, discontinued in the same year that I started in 2003, uh, which meant that by the final year of my BA in 2005, there were only seven students left in the Institute, uh, but we had both the space and the, and the budget from the school to finish our, our degrees, which was uh, part of the obligation to after letting us in. And so with some crucial inspiration from um, a young uh, guest teacher, Anne Jortegutu, uh, we decided to self-organize and take uh, charge of the program and the curriculum of uh, our final year. And this became something we turned into a, a study program about the, the role of the artist, maybe the changing role of the artist, or just to identify what is the role of the artist in, in the art scene and in, uh, and in society, which had both the featured exhibition making, self-publishing, um, and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of producing and distributing um, of, uh, of uh, artworks and mainly, mainly as discourse maybe. Um, and by the spring of that final year, uh, four of us had decided that this, um, our making our own education as uh, students was an artistic practice in itself. So along with uh, Ingrid Lennendal, Silje Hugsta and Elisabeth Schei, uh, I set up the artist collective, the Institute for Color, which was uh, the name of our study program. Uh, and we had, as far as I know, the first uh, collective exam and uh, graduation in, um, in Norway as uh, an artist group. And the four of us continued to work together under this old school name for uh, about a decade. Um, but for this presentation, I think the key word to take away from that is, is uh, organizing or even self-organizing as uh, something we can bring to uh, the Norwegian art scene in order to understand it better. Um, there's one more story I want to give before uh, ready to dive into the art scene itself. Um, and this was from, uh, we started about a year after I graduated with my MA in arts. Um, and this is now in 2009. And um, for reason that you'll come to understand the, uh, uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, Oslo had a really vibrant artist-run gallery scene um, at that time. And in the back room of one of these artist-run uh, uh, galleries, um, a space called Rekord, I shared the studio with my colleague Stian Eide Kluge. And that gallery closed um, as the lease came to an end. And Stian and I had to look for a new studio. And as luck had it, we, we just chanced upon a really amazing place. It was this tiny timber house with the green asbestos plated uh, exterior and the loud orange floral pattern uh, linoleum floor. And through the back door, it was uh, partly enveloping this tiny house was one of the last remaining industrial lumber yards of downtown Oslo with the crumbling floor and concrete walls and the uh, high skylight uh, ceilings and for various reasons there were the larger art institutions in Oslo all seemed to be dead or dying at the time around 2010 so um, we opened 1857 it was an artist run space um, that showed um, young or mainly young international artists and where we produced uh, new works, mostly on site and in close collaboration with the artists. And we ran uh, 1857 from uh, 2010 to 2019, um, when we called it quits there for, uh, um, and went on to other projects. Uh, but for the purpose of this presentation, um, I think 1857 or this artist run space um, offers more of a question, like what is the use of art institutions? Um, and maybe coupled with the a do-it-yourself attitude that we will also come to recognize in the, in the 
Norwegian art scene. So this has brought us up to, to 2020, or at least me in, in my biography here. Um, and that brings us to, uh, to uh, UQS. Let's see if I can start that. Here we are, UQS, I'm in the background. Uh, so UQS is uh, an uh, organization and an exhibition space for, uh, and as, the, as an exhibition space, it's mainly for young and uh, or emerging, if you want to call it that, artists. And it has a long history in uh, Norway. And in fact, one of the one of the projects that I took over when uh, I entered UQS um, was a long planned 100 year anniversary to be held in 2021. Um, and the book, which would be the first historical overview of the organization was well underway. Um, and this book, it tells the story of UQS, but it also um, gives the artist's perspective on the history of the art scene in Norway. Um, and maybe also a key factor here on the, maybe in any historical account, is uh, the artist's economy. This is the book right here, which is in it's in Norwegian. I should also say that it's uh, generous, generously supported by the Vedelads Fund, who has uh, uh, paid for uh, for uh, a copy for each of the members of the uh, artist NBK uh, artist union. So, if you are a member of the artist union, you can pick up your own copy at uh, UQS or at some of the art centers around the. Around the country, or we can send it to you for uh, for shipping. Um, but now begins this understanding part of this presentation, um, and we begin with uh, with requests and one hundred years ago in uh, nineteen twenty one. Uh, request was founded by a group of artists at the cafe in Oslo, as something like an artist club. And uh, these artists were in opposition to uh, what can be called the academy rule of uh, establishment artists at the time. And they had uh, a view to, uh, to socialize and to form a community of young artists. And they also wanted to do something about issues like exhibition opportunities. And they fundraised for grants and they auctioned uh, members' works. And one important venue for this uh, this work was uh, masquerades and gala dinners for would-be benefactors. So this is a um, this is a quite different art scene from what we are used to uh, in uh, Norway today. Um, but this was a this was a, the beginning of uh, of what would eventually be big changes in uh, both arts and, uh, and cultural policy. Because despite uh, all the fancy fancy dresses here, uh, the conditions for artists in uh, depression era Norway um, were precarious. It was hard for uh, artists to, to make a living. Um, and this inspired request to set up a goods exchange central. So in addition to uh, putting up auctions where uh, works were sold for cash, uh, there was a gallery set up where, um, where goods, I think the idea was to, um, that people would bring uh, potatoes or winter coats or uh, uh, essentials uh, like that uh, to trade it for, uh, for uh, artworks. Um, but also, household appliances uh, and um, uh, and even services could be traded for art. And uh, a story from from this time says that the, the one profession that was most interested in uh, getting artworks through this barter system um, were the dentists. So there were a lot of dental appointments being put on offer uh, for uh, artists to trade in their artworks. Uh, so it was said that uh, even though the artists didn't have much to eat, they had the best teeth of any professions in uh, Norway. Um, 
This is also maybe something that we can still still see around dentists waiting rooms or a dentist's office that there could be um, artworks hanging. Um, maybe a plug for a fellow uh, artist organization, the Visual Artists in Oslo. They just made a deal to have uh, discounted dental services for artists. So this is um, still a very relevant uh, relevant social issue. Um, 1930s, of course, was a period of uh, of, uh, of uh, turmoil and uh, great development in uh, Norwegian and uh, I should say European history. But uh, in Norway specifically, um, the 1930s saw the first social democratic uh, government um, after the Labour Party got into power after this crisis accords in 1935, which is uh, maybe not so much talk about, but a, a key moment in uh, Norwegian history, which is when this uh, Keynesian plan economics took uh, took hold and where the labor unions got a formalized role of negotiating with the um, employer organizations. Um, so uh, that the three parties of the employers, the labor organizations and the state will mean to meet to uh, set the wage levels. Um, and this sounds quite dry, um, especially in a presentation about um, the art scene maybe, but it is really crucial in order to understand the Norwegian art scene. And this was also something that came to uh, define the further development of the uh, UKS, um, because from the 1960s on, um, uh, UKS um, especially, and um, after a while the artist organization uh, started to take on the role of artist unions. So we see a shift from these uh, masquerades um, into something that looks uh, more like uh, um, political and the policy organizations. And uh, one of the things I was uh, very happy to learn about in this 100 year anniversary work was to uh, talk to some of these uh, older artists to find out what the inspiration was for, for this uh, shift, because I, th I think that it's um, quite surprising that you go from these uh, gala dinners to uh, sitting down and having uh, union model um, negotiations about compensation. So I've been curious about what the inspiration was. And I found, <laughs> finally got uh, an uh, answer from um, the, Biran Dam of uh, Norwegian uh, textile art, uh, Britt Fulvåg. Um, and uh, Britt was uh, an, um, a, a textile, textile artist, um, a, a weaver, um, but who went, to, um, went on, on an uh, exchange to Warsaw, um, which had in, uh, in the around 1960, um, maybe the most progressive or, or avant-garde um, uh, textile art program in, uh, in Europe, as, a, as I've come to understand it. I'm not expert in, in, textile, uh, in textile art. Here I'm leaning on maybe uh, Brit's own story about her, uh, her biography. But what's crucial here is that she, she returned to Norway as, as a young artist and, uh, and uh, set up her, her uh, practice and became a and a fairly, fairly well-known um, young artist, artist working in the medium of textile. And this landed her um, a gig as a, as a teacher, as a young professor at the, the School of Applied Arts in the textile department. Um, and she wasn't much uh, older than, than the students. So this meant that she uh, both had a strong connection with them, and she also had a, a strong sense of, of uh, maybe fairness or uh, or uh, of uh, a desire for this uh, workplace to be a bit more organized. Because the teachers came and went; they all uh, there were no contracts in place, as we are maybe used to as artists uh, nowadays. Nowadays, but educational sector is a bit more uh, formal than. Um, um, than much of the art world. 
but at the time the teachers came in and did their uh, they did their uh, did their courses and they got their little uh, uh, pay like their uh, their pay at the um, at the end of the week from the from the principal's office but there were um, two employees who were steady employees through the through uh, throughout the year in the school of applied arts and in um, and in the, in the art academy and that was the um, the live uh, uh, drawing the live drawing models so the nude models for the drawing classes which was a daily part of the of the art academy program uh, and there were these two also quite famous figures after a while um, uh, Maurice at the academy and Lotte at the school of the applied arts um, uh, and they also got their their pay just to sort of in cash and with no contract. Um, but their problem was that the school year is only uh, 10 months. And then for the holidays, they didn't have any pay. They didn't have any any rights to holiday because they didn't have any contract. And this wouldn't do, be it said. So she managed to set up an, an, an NTL union, uh, a union in, in the school and, and Maurice and Lotte enrolled. And then she got uh, some of the representatives from the from the main labor union to come along to a meeting with the Ministry of Education to say that here are some employees who don't have contracts, they don't have fixed wages, and they don't have rights, and you need to you need to sort you need to sort this out. But she says that she met a very dismissive uh, uh, bureaucrat in the Ministry of Education who said that, bah, these art schools, there's no like. What's the need for artists and why do artists need to draw people anyway can't you just draw some fruit baskets or something and then lotte stood up in tears and she said i'm no banana and started crying and then the labor union representatives rose up and said this is scandalous we are calling a major strike if this is not resolved and then the ministry of education person said well well we don't want to risk any trouble like that over to to uh, uh, two models so we'll get the contract and they uh, and they got the fixed employ employment and the union was set up and Brit says that just on leaving that meeting she thought is it really that easy you just formalize your uh, your uh, your organizations and then you make your demands and then and then you are heard because you have uh, you have the right on uh, on your side so this uh, organizing can lead to uh, to uh, to change and it often has and uh, i want to uh, give some examples about how artists organizing has shaped uh, the norwegian art scene because this structure really does more to uh, define the norwegian art scene than any account of of uh, artworks or artists or or institutions um, will do um, and I'd also argue that to understand these frameworks, it's necessary to understand this, our current situation as uh, as artists, and also the the, the future potential or or uh, the future outcomes of uh, of art in Norway. And um, let's see, much of uh, the activity of. UKS as an artist organization, and then from the 60s on, and as an artist union, um, has still been in the form of exhibition organizing. So it's not um, it's not that we're leaving exhibitions or artworks behind here, um, but um, these things take place against a backdrop, and maybe also with some agency into um, both the policy and into living and working conditions of, uh, of artists. Um, so it is very it is very telling that um, one of the decisive moments in the development of Norwegian cultural policy uh, came through an exhibition um, at UQS. And this was in 1971. And it was actually the 50 year anniversary uh, uh, of, uh, of UQS, um, where the exhibition Kunstnerkor, or the conditions of artists, um, was set up, and it was based on uh, uh, a survey done by uh, uh, Aina Helgesen, 
um, of uh, demographic and income uh, data um, of Norwegian artists that was done for the Norwegian Institute for Social Research. Um, this research had been uh, some years in, uh, in uh, the making. I think the survey was from 69. But when it was presented, and here you can see in the picture that it's uh, um, some of the numbers here are, are they're framed in these golden frames and, and put in a very a very obvious artwork style presentation. Um, and this was in order for the for uh, maybe the artists to to read some of this data and also to make sure that everyone knew that this was something that was open to uh, open knowledge to everyone. Uh, because this uh, research um, told of systematically precarious living and working conditions for artists where uh, really no one was making any money, even the successful artists who sold a lot had very little, uh, uh, if you calculated this into a, a wage, there was very little uh, uh, left to live from. So this galvanized the artists and then um, called them into action. Uh, and there are some of those who are involved who have received a lot of uh, uh, credit and some have uh, received too little. And here I think it's better to just pass on mentioning um, any of the names. But just said, say that there was a lot of hectic activity. There was uh, a lot of meetings, conferences and, and seminars and a lot of different proposals that uh, uh, just both came up and were discussed and some of them dismissed or and developed. Um, and this was also discussions that uh, united uh, visual artists and writers, actors, um, musicians um, in making demands for a more ambitious uh, social policy. And, and these key demands that uh, grew out of, uh, of this, that have um, really um, um, stayed with us for the half century since um, are these. It's the fair compensation for the public use of art, an increase in the public use of art, and a minimum income for those not covered by the above. And, and there was a lot of ideas and discussion around these uh, demands as well uh, that laid the groundwork for, uh, for cultural policy. Um, and this led to uh, a formalizing and expansion of some key parts of the artist's economy. Um, one thing to mention is uh, uh, a 5% uh, art sales tax that was uh, had been established already in 1948. Maybe I should say that it's on the basis of a proposal made by UQS in 1939. Um, um, this is a collectivized tax that's managed by an artist-owned fund, uh, BKH, the Visual Artists uh, Aid Fund. It was also called for young and needy artists um, originally, which I think is a wonderful uh, way to specify it. Um, but this is uh, uh, grounded in legislation, so not in, not, uh, in cultural policy uh, directly. And it goes uh, into then a fund that's owned by the artists. And then there's another important fund uh, for uh, copyright fees or Vedlagsfonde that came later in 1985. Uh, but this is also based on this idea of a collectivization of artist rights. Um, and in this case, it's the copyrights for works that are owned by the state and exhibited to the public, uh, where the artist unions negotiate for a compensation uh, fee, which is then distributed uh, uh, to artists uh, through a fund. Um, and these two funds come in addition to um, public support for uh, to artists that come through grants and stipends um, and also of course the income that artists themselves get through sales and commissions. Um, but this means that about two-thirds of the of the grants that are available to artists in Norway come through funds that are owned by the artists um, in a collective way. And one important effect of this is that uh, that, uh, that artists uh, elect our own uh, stipend committees. 
review all the applications and uh, uh, and that they do this work both for these artists on fund but also uh, for the state stipends because since the work is already done there's no uh, there are no other experts committees who can uh, who could uh, do this on a competitive uh, level so it's uh, an important service and maybe an important way to uh, protect this um, and uh, this uh, stipend process that the artists uh, do in um, in serving on these uh, stipend committees, um, but this also means that all the these uh, artist stipends um, are granted by a committee of artists who are elected by the artist unions, which again means that the artist union membership is high since it uh, offers real influence, and this is quite unique uh, even among the Nordic countries. Um, and I'd say that in Norway, it's even cool to be a member of an artist union, uh, which I've come to understand that isn't the case in many or most other uh, places. I would say that, of course. Um, but the key to this influence um, is for the artists um, to organize, of course, but then to identify parts of the art economy where we as artists have ownership or some sort of legal right that can give us the basis for negotiation. So copyright is uh, one such right, uh, and this droit de suite or this uh, tax on art sales, which is um, in Norway uh, also on the, the primary art market or the works of art that's sold by the artist directly. Uh, contract law would be uh, another. There could be various uh, uh, conventions or other things that uh, bind the state where artists are, are parties and can uh, uh, and can negotiate. Uh, and I think this would be key for artists to organize to uh, better their conditions uh, anywhere, um, which I think is uh, uh, and. Uh, optimistic part of our times is that there are artists uh, unions and artist organizations uh, being set up throughout the world in order to counter uh, precarious uh, labor conditions and social uh, conditions. Um, and also the key to making these negotiations is of course that we are able to set up something where we can um, uh, negotiate um, collectively. Um, and this is a lot of uh, this is a lot of work, and uh, it, it is uh, challenging to organize um, individualists as artists often are. Um, but by setting up something that's um, robust and that's grounded in in law and not in policy uh, or grounded in rights, uh, it means that you can set up something that can last for generations, like uh, um, like these agreements. Um, uh, that we've seen here in, in uh, Norway. Um, maybe I should mention also now, um, before the break, the, the, the third of uh, these uh, three-point uh, demands that's more of a sad story in the Norwegian context, this minimum income for those uh, uh, not covered by the increase in compensation and, uh, and uh, sales. Um, but it is a really key demand, uh, especially considering this post-pandemic uh, economy. I think this is something that we could uh, we would do well to uh, give more attention, both uh, both on on the artist union side, but I think also as uh, as artists and and as uh, uh, societies. I think I will get more into how this. Uh, uh, groundwork or framework has shaped um, the institutions um, that make up the Norwegian art scene. Uh, but maybe this is a good place to take some uh, to take some uh, questions um, or maybe to start to uh, yes start. yeah thank you Stefan um, uh, there was a question in the chat. Let me see um, if I can find it. It says Institute of Color open for members, question mark. It should be, or I guess uh, I wish, uh, but uh, the Institute for Color was uh, 
first is education that uh, I'll blame the National Academy for shuttering it. So that means that the artist group was only made up of um, the four of us, of artists who carried this heritage on. Uh, mm -hmm. and we did our uh, final like goodbye exhibition in the Rogaland Kunst Center in 2015. Okay. 14, 14 a sort of 10, 10 year uh, anniversary, we, we called it. So alas, no more. Uh, I, I can also say if you will have a question, you can either put it in the chat function or you can press the reactions but, uh, button and press this ha raise hand function. Um, if you if you want to ask your question, I think we're going to take a five minute break. And as I said in the start, uh, where you will after the break, you will talk more generally about the art scene. Uh, but as I said in the start. Um, it would be great if people were just in the chat function, which is under more on the bottom of your screen. There's a type in the flag of, of from where you're from, not where you're situated at the moment, but which country you're from. It's just for fun. It's quite interesting to see this. It was mainly Norwegian and Romanian participants, but also from um, the US, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Moldova, Ireland. Yes. Excellent, South Africa. So it's a very um, varied group of people, which is excellent. Um, but we'll just have a five minute break. Is that okay with you, Stefan? Yes. And then I'll uh, put on some cheesy music uh, so you know, remember when to start and come back to the screen, everyone. So we'll have a five minute break. Thank you.
so um hope you enjoyed Herb, Herb Alpert and his T1 brass. It used to be the um the music at Norwegian um cooking shows on television when they were showing the food uh, in the um in the cooker. Okay, Stefan. Um let's just start um part two. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I didn't hear any uh, of the music, but uh, I've heard it before. I can I can imagine. Yeah, you can imagine. <laughs> and I hope we. Um, <laughs> um, so the the section between the uh, break was quite uh, um, I guess kind of uh, abstract to uh, what is uh, going on in uh, the Norwegian uh, art scene in terms of uh, in terms of artists and institutions. But of course, the, uh, how to uh, how to make uh, how to make a living and then how to make your work is a um, key concern for um, for all of us. Um, and I think the the foundations of these um, conditions also do a lot to shape um, what what can exist and what what we can do uh, as artists. Um, now this part will have maybe the more of a, of a form of a list because uh, I would like to go through some of the uh, some key institutions and some key. Uh, some key actors in the Norwegian art scene that uh, define or, or shape it in, in various ways. Um, that means that there won't be so much time to go much into detail about uh, any of them, but uh, I'm also happy to, um, uh, to take questions or, uh, or uh, offer um, any insights that I might have about how these things are connected and uh, what use they are to uh, to us as uh, artists or or as cultural workers. And um, see, there we are. And a lot of this will uh, take the form of the um, websites for the purpose of this uh, uh, presentation. And. Um, then it's also easy for you to find uh, to find more information or to get in contact if you need to. Um, the um, Arts Council is, um, of course, very current whenever there's an application deadline. Um, it's the it's the, the it's the top thing on my to do list at least. Um, uh, but the Arts Council is also something that comes out of this uh, uh, this uh, foundation of uh, cultural policy in uh, Norway. So it goes back also to the 1960s, which is when uh, when governments um, across Europe took more interest in cultural uh, policy as uh, as an important policy area and not something that was uh, to be left to Philanthropy or to private markets um, to uh, to um, to sort out, uh, and the Arts Council is um, uh, is uh, set up as uh, an advisory board, as it says um, here, and what we as what we like to call an an arm's length to uh, uh, the Ministry of Culture. So it's uh, a government uh, agency, uh, but it's. Uh, not supposed to be uh, governed by uh, politicians or by uh, political concerns. And of course, just having an arts council in itself is a quite political concern or po political act. Um, and the ways that this play out is uh, constantly, uh, constantly debated, um, uh, I would say, but uh, there's a, there's a, back and forth uh, between the Arts Council being sort of an, 
the extended arm of the Ministry of Culture and to be the arm's length that uh, protects artists from uh, political control. Um, it was set up in 1965 and at the time there was a fund, there was an, an art fund that was set up to uh, be distributed among uh, all the arts, so uh, including music and literature, theater, as well as the visual arts. Um, and the fund at the beginning was 10 million kroner. Uh, I'm not sure what that would be in 2022 money, um, but for next year it's uh, 927 million kroner all in all in, in, uh, in the budget. So that would translate to something like 90, 90 million euros. Um, the Arts Council um, have um, a lot of different uh, grant, uh, grant schemes and support categories. I think they are also the ones managing these uh, EEA um, funds um, that this presentation is uh, part of on the Norwegian side. So for uh, any uh, cr cross, uh, uh, cross Europe collaborations, um, uh, they're the place to go for them. Um, they get around 1200 applications to for visual art uh, projects uh, each year. And those applications are read by professionals from the field uh, who are appointed by, um, uh, they're appointed by the government, but they're also nominated through artists organizations. So this is also uh, a place where artists have their say through being um, organized. And one of the other, Maybe an offshoot of the Arts Council back in the day, uh, and one of the other uh, big players in the Norwegian um, art scene is the um, uh, Public Art Norway, as it's called. Um, it was set up in uh, in the seventies as a decorations fund, so it was called an utsmykingsfond, uh, and it was to beautify or decorate um, public uh, buildings, uh, and that was formerly a responsibility that the Arts Council had, um, but it uh, grew into a specialized um, a specialized task and uh, uh, what's now called Kuru was set up to uh, handle it. Um, for a long time, there was a, a campaign from artist organization that uh, uh, the basis of this uh, uh, public art Norway fund would be um, one percent uh, set aside from uh, public construction, um, which is something that exists in uh, in uh, in many countries as part of uh, cultural policy, um, and it did that did come into play in uh, sometime in the nineties, I think, um, uh, and now it's gone a bit up and down with the uh, one. Uh, 1%, I think it's about three quarters of a percent that goes into this fund on average. Um, but also the way that the public buildings are constructed and financed now is uh, uh, more complicated than just putting up a building and having a, a mural uh, done on site. Um, so there are um, uh, both the temporary projects in public space. And there's also a collection that's used for public buildings uh, in um, and that are leased temporarily um, that's uh, owned by Kuro. So they're actually also a big uh, buyer of, uh, of, uh, of uh, art artworks. And coming to institutions or exhibition spaces, I think the first one um, would be the, the National Museum. Um, I was a bit unsure if it, it made sense to, uh, to um, uh, talk about or to present the National Museum first or at the end of going through this list, because it, uh, it serves a lot of functions, I would say, both uh, for artists directly and as a, a big uh, steward of uh, Norwegian uh, art history and cultural heritage. Um, the museum itself goes back to 
the National Gallery, um, which uh, uh, was, I should maybe say, used to past tense, uh, a, a very classic national pictures gallery um, that went back to the middle of the 19th century. Um, and uh, had a building that now sits uh, vacant in the center of uh, Oslo as uh, the National Museum uh, finally uh, moved into its new building that you can see here in the center of the picture in June this year. So this is maybe um, the newest, most recent art institution that we, uh, that we have here. Um, the National Museum was also a merger of uh, different museums. Uh, so there was the National Gallery, the historical art collection, and also the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, which is also a complicated historical construct, maybe. It was uh, set up after some debate in the, in the 1980s and opened in 1990. So it's a quite young museum of, uh, of contemporary art. Um, and it had the, uh, it, uh, this would maybe be the reason to, to, um, to uh, talk about uh, the National Museum at, uh, at the end of going through this uh, institution, because one of the important functions of the Museum of Contemporary Art was to spark a lot of protests and uh, uh, among artists, and uh, it led to artists setting up their own artist-run spaces and their own galleries. Um, maybe especially in response to a policy in the beginning to uh, not collect uh, video art, for example, uh, was uh, a very good reason for the many young artists working with video art in the 1990s to set up their own exhibition spaces, um, which of course became uh, as defining for that uh, decade in Norwegian art as uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art itself. Stefan, can yeah. I just... Um, add quickly, you might uh, speak to this later, but it's important to know that with um, the funding in the Arts Council does not go to like the National Museum because that's on, on the state budget or on the cultural department, you know. Yes. All these major institutions are funded through that and not through the uh, Arts Council, which is more directed towards um, smaller organizations and artists. Yes. So, yeah, thank you. And then maybe that's also worth uh, saying, that's another level of this, uh, where these uh, policy decisions get uh, made. Um, the National Museum now is, uh, of course, a massively expensive uh, project as well. So in talking about the, the funding that goes into it, the, the arts fund or the arts, the fund that uh, the Art Council uh, um, distributes is uh, about uh, a billion kroner. And the National Museum is also about a billion kroner budget every year. So slightly more to operate this one museum than what the Arts Council itself um, uh, distributes. Uh, but the National Museum goes, uh, they, uh, they go, are directly funded over the Ministry of Culture, but uh, they are an independent uh, museum with with their own with their own board, and uh, should also have an arm's length to the politicians, so that there's no direct political control over uh, what they buy or what uh, what uh, uh, exhibitions they put on, uh, and uh, and so forth. Um, which is good, of course, in freedom of speech terms. It can be frustrating when you think as artists that they are doing the wrong thing and you want them to do something differently. Uh, it's hard to appeal to the politicians to change, uh, to change it around. You have to apply to their uh, honesty and sense of professionalism, um, which we, of course, um, try to do as much as we can. But speaking of this, um, um, the cultural budget. There are uh, a number of other uh, museums that are uh, funded through the Ministry of Culture and under the, the cultural budget directly. Um, and uh, these are also uh, 
museums that operate independently, but mainly through uh, public funds. Um, and um, there are regional museums, like in Oslo, there's uh, Munk and Vigelan uh, museums um, uh, set up on municipal or the city's art collections. And there, there are the Kuda art museums in uh, in Bergen. That's uh, another big merger, uh, but based on uh, on uh, collections that are uh, held held by uh, by the city or institutions in the city. And there are regional museums um, uh, in uh, in uh, Trondheim. There's a new merger of museums going on uh, there, uh, as well as a new public and private uh, museum being set up in Kristiansand and museums in Stavanger, Tromsø, uh, Lillehammer and uh, a number of others um, uh, around the country. Um, and then there are also on this, or maybe also I should mention here that there are also some uh, institutions that are built on private collections that uh, uh, either call themselves museums or they operate as museums or there are some combinations that they either operate or call themselves museums or some uh, combinations that are also scattered around the, the country that are sometimes um, sometimes get some funding over the the, the public uh, budget but uh, but often uh, mainly privately operated um, but on this regional level there's also um, uh, some independent institutions or uh, 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 institutions that some various ways are supported by both uh, both uh, uh, state and municipal levels, um, but that have their own their own uh, uh, boards and their own uh, their own histories and re reason to be. Some. Uh, uh, some of them are, are listed here as the Kunsthallene in Norge, the Kunsthaus in Norway. Um, some are not part of this uh, uh, umbrella organization, and maybe worth uh, mentioning first um, the Kunstnernes Hus, uh, which is uh, an artist-owned um, uh, Kunsthall in uh, Oslo that was set up in by artists in 1930 um, with the um, with a benefit auction and a fundraiser to uh, for the artist to raise fund to um, to build a, a building for art in uh, near the royal palace in Oslo, and um, and there's also in the same neighborhood in Oslo there's Kunstneforbundet, which is uh, also kind of hybrid artist-run space, which is owned by uh, artist shareholders um, uh, who collectively own the own a building and uh, they put up a number of exhibition also with some uh, with uh, public funding as well um, but um, but um, mainly through sales and in bergen of course there's the bergen kunsthall uh, which is the a former kunstforening like some of these other kunsthalls uh, here and um, that's set up as what's uh, a common model in in Germany, at least, is where, what I think about. I was here in this Kunstverening. I hear this German Kunstverein, which is uh, set up by people who are interested in art and who are interested in making exhibitions and maybe also connect, collecting and following art. Uh, historically, some of these are very old um, associations or or um, Verening, and they are very widespread among uh, uh, around uh, Norway. Uh, but a few of them are very big as I could call uh, Bergen Kunsthall uh, and uh, maybe also some of some of these here would qualify as uh, as very big and quite his and quite uh, with quite long histories um, but some of them are also more recent like Kunsthall Oslo and uh, Kunsthall Trondheim uh, at least uh, are uh, quite like recent additions to this Kunsthall family and are maybe set up more in this uh, more a curate, like a Kunstverein run by a curator, a Kunstverein or a Kunsthall with a, with a strong curatorial uh, uh, profile and uh, maybe more of a mandate to, um, 
to uh, public dissemination or uh, public mediation of, uh, of art. Um, this may also, yeah, they're just below, uh, they only have half their logo here. Um, uh, but it's also worth mentioning as one of these Kunsthalle is um, a photo galleria or uh, the gallery for photographers uh, that was set up by uh, FFF, uh, the Association of Free Photographers, as they call themselves, um, which uh, was an or arts organization that played a major role in establishing photography as, as a form of uh, contemporary art or as an artistic medium and not just a commercial medium in, uh, in uh, uh, Norway. Um, and this is also a, a way of operating that has put in place another number of art exhibition around the country, uh, which is the regional art centers. Uh, these are distinct from this Kunsthall or uh, uh, Kunstverein, uh, and that they are set up not by people who are appreciators of art, but by people who are producers of, um, of art. And they were established by the artist organizations in the 1970s. Um, and there are 15 of these art centers that are organized by KIN, the Kunstcentrene i Norge. Um, here I might uh, have thought that the photo gallery, for example, might have been part of this, but they are not. They are a Kunsthall uh, here and more independent. But these are quite varied group of, uh, of uh, exhibition spaces. Um, some of them are quite close, maybe indistinguishable from uh, this uh, Kunsthall uh, program where uh, Hordaland Kunstcenter or or uh, in Bergen or Nitya Center for Santiskunst, for example, or, uh, are um, uh, quite uh, independent of uh, their artist organizations and sort of appear as uh, municipal art galleries or municipal art institutions. Um, but they, are, uh, they don't have collections and they have uh, often some mandate to making uh, art uh, visible uh, to uh, new groups of audience like uh, children or uh, senior citizens or or other groups who are uh, po of political focus in in their municipalities um maybe also a part of uh, a part of this uh, landscape could be uh, the art festivals <coughs> and biennials that exist throughout Norway, like the Momentum Biennial that's in uh, Moss, uh, or Liaf in Lofoten, uh, or the uh, Bergen Assembly in uh, uh, Bergen. Uh, uh, and there's also some art festivals that's like the Oslo Open or Be Open, where artists open their studios, uh, which I think could be called art festivals uh, in a way, but uh, maybe uh, refreshingly sometimes uh, without any curatorial statements or profiles. Uh, and there's also um, the annual Höstutstillingen, which is held at the Kunstnernes Hus, uh, which is um, an annual exhibition now running for some 140 something years, I think, um, which is juried by artists and um, Maybe coming from UQS again has been the source of much debate and much protests from artists uh, over the years. Um, but I think it's a, kind of a, a dear old relative in this family of uh, art uh, festivals. There's also applications open for, uh, for everyone. I don't think you have to be based in Norway or Norwegian in order to, uh, to apply. Uh, so that's a juried show with open call and some 4,000 applications, I think, every every year for the jury to sort out. Stefan, uh, yes. I just want to quickly to say when it comes to the Kunsthals, mm. that um, <clears throat> every year in May um, in Bergen Kunsthal, that's the, in connection with the Bergen Music Festival, that's the Festspill exhibition. And it's one of the sort of greatest, um, I guess, appointments you can get as a contemporary mm. artist in Norway. So one artist is given this um, 
six weeks uh, exhibition in Bankenstock, which is always really renowned and it's really interesting to see. I think it's also, it's, um, I think it has a, 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 a very positive thing for the art, uh, the art scene in Norway that it's quite like it's, it is uh, in many ways a quite uh, uh, sort of a, uh, positive and encouraging environment where there's a lot of collaborations going on between these institutions. And I think there's a quite strong agreement. I think everyone agrees that the Festspielutstillingen at Bergen Kunsthall is like the most important solo exhibition in Norway. Um, even if other, other institutions might grudge it a bit, but I think they're all like, oh, everyone agrees that this is the one thing that's uh, worth, that's the, the highest honor. So it's, uh, and that's, I think, quite rare because it's uh, in many places, there would be competition to have this uh, prime spot in the exhibition calendar. Uh, but it uh, sits firmly with Bergen Kunsthall and the Festspielutstillingen, I would say. Um, here it's also, um, uh, I would uh, go amiss if I didn't promote uh, UQS and the UQS exhibition space. Uh, maybe also first to mention the other um, artist organizations um, that have um, that have exhibition spaces, um, uh, and those would be the sister organizations of UQS that are all um, organized under the Norwegian uh, uh, the Norwegian um, Visual Artists uh, Artist Union umbrella. So this would be uh, the Sculptors Association, Billedhogerforeningen, uh, Tegnerforbundet, um, Soft for the Textile Artists, and the Painters, the Landsforeningen for Norske Malere, Painters Association, and the Printmakers, Norske Grafikere. Uh, they all have their galleries. Um, as does UQS, who's the only, um, the only organization among these to not be uh, a medium, specific artist organization, if you don't count being young as a medium in itself for artists. Um, this is an image of the of the new UQS space before renovation. Now it looks completely different and it will look even more different on the 13th of January, but this is in an old uh, theater uh, downtown in Oslo, in Kaisersgate number one. And again, you're all very welcome to the opening or whenever you visit um, Oslo. Um, there's also, and there are also some of the, the other sisters or uh, cousins in the artist organization like the Billed Kunstner in Oslo uh, and other artist union uh, around the country who have, um, um, who have uh, uh, gallery spaces uh, set up. There are also a lot of artist run spaces who, that uh, come and go. This is a map from the uh, exhibition guide from Oslo, which is one, one place to start. I tried to find the Bergen exhibition guide, but I think it hasn't been updated since before the pandemic or it's a new... Correct, yeah. If someone knows, they can put, put it in the, 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 the chat, maybe a, a link. Uh, this notes... Um, uh, both uh, institutions and, um, and galleries. And the A's here denote artist-run spaces that are scattered around town. Uh, and uh, some also pop up uh, more frequent than this map is uh, able to, uh, able to, to uh, catch. Um, 1857 uh, that I used to run was um, of course one of these spaces when, when uh, that existed. And there are some other long running spaces like Entre in Bergen, who, that was also part of a pilot program through the Arts Council to support these artist run spaces uh, with some operating costs to, to pay uh, rent and fees for, for the artists. Um, and which, was, which has been an important part of recognizing this, um, this uh, artist run uh, scene. Um, Maybe there was an ambition to professionalize it or formalize it, but I think the funding maybe stops a bit sh short of uh, of that. Uh, but still, there's there is a vibrant community of these artist-run spaces, and now in the, in the most larger cities in Norway, uh, I would say. Um, 
and there are also uh, commercial galleries or private galleries, um, uh, of course, uh, also in Oslo, uh, like uh, uh, like Gallery uh, Ries or uh, Standard uh, or uh, some younger galleries in Oslo, uh, like Sixes and Sevens or Golsa or Femten Sesse, that's run by my old colleague from 1857, Janne uh, or Iska, um, and a number of these that can be found here. Um, and I've spent most of this presentation talking about the, the uh, policy for, um, for arts and culture and the way that public funding uh, structures the, the uh, both the artists' work and living conditions uh, and uh, and uh, opportunities and institutions um, that exist. But there is an art market as well, um, and uh, I also promised uh, Ashlak to to uh, bring this into the presentation as well. Uh, the the art market is about the same size as the national the budget for the national museum um maybe the national museum themselves would say that a lot of their budget goes to rent that goes directly back into the state and um, this is uh, the the size of the art market of the art that's being bought through uh, galleries or directly from artists or uh, or through uh, auctions uh, in norway so it's money that goes directly into art institutions and art infrastructure and directly to uh, to artists. And it's also about uh, uh, one uh, billion kroner or about a hundred million uh, uh, euros. Um, and it has been said that there is no market for art in uh, Norway and uh, that anything that's painted, composed or written or played in the country is decided in agreement between the state and the artist organizations. Um, and maybe this talk has uh, played into that uh, myth, um, but it is not uh, true. Um, what is true, though, is that also the art market is uh, um, is uh, it's regulated through this agreement of uh, the five percent tax, and it's also closely monitored by the Arts Council Norway, as you can see, um, who publishes every year uh, Kunst Ital or Art in Numbers. Um, uh, by the uh, Ramböll consultancy firm has done this for, for the past years. And this means that both uh, we as artists and the policymakers can keep uh, close track of uh, what moves in, uh, in uh, the uh, art market. Um, here we can see a large growth in the, in the, the pandemic years. And this is maybe also worth uh, noting that uh, um, as part of this quite robust art infrastructure, um, when the pandemic hit and the, the um, exhibition opportunities uh, disappeared, and there was uh, concerns about the, the the art market and the and the foundations or the basis for uh, for the galleries. Um, the government stepped in with the funding and. A stimulus package for uh, for arts and uh, culture during the pandemic, and here the artist organizations as well were very quick to call for uh, stimulus that uh, mirrored these same demands that uh, the artist organizations have always done. That you need to buy more art from artists, and artists need more stimulus to produce art and to get the fair compensation for the arts. Um, uh, that's being done, and this was again the part where where artists, uh, where policy came into being. Uh, so where artists uh, did not get much uh, uh, social security, or uh, were able to get much of the compensation, or the yeah the compensation that was put in place, or the social security that was put in place, um, artists did get a lot of uh, stimulus in terms of uh, extra. Uh, extra market uh, or extra buy-in. Uh, this also meant that some of the uh, main policy goals of, uh, of uh, uh, the cultural policy in supporting uh, public uh, acquisition of artworks so that um, 
uh, female artists or younger artists would get a larger market share. Um, uh, we saw a market increase in those policy goals to diversify the, 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 the art market from this stimulus packages. So the of this uh, um, art market in 2021, um, the female uh, percentage of, uh, of the art market or the bar artworks that were made by female artists went up to 19%, which is still quite shockingly low for um, such a egalitarian uh, society as, uh, as uh, Norway. But it, it did improve once uh, public funding got into uh, the art market. So at least it, uh, at least it helps in this lopsided market. I think this uh, was a quick, uh, like a very quick run through of um, art institutions. Maybe another way to follow this that I should mention is um, is um, the art publications and the criticism that uh, which is a way to follow the Norwegian art scene from abroad uh, and also to follow it from within Norway of course, through uh, kunstkritik.no, which is uh, again a publication set up by a union or a writers organization uh, to promote uh, criticism of uh, or um, reviews of Norwegian art and it has an English language international edition um, and it is a Nordic publication so it is a collaboration now between uh, Norwegian, uh, uh, Swedish and Danish um, editors. Um, also the artist association put out Billedkunst um, which is not in English um, Few texts are, are in English, I think. Yeah, yeah. few texts in, uh, are in English. Depending on the writer. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's recommended for those who either already speak Norwegians or Norwegian, or those who want to learn by uh, looking at the pictures and following along. That's uh, um, a good way to to pick up uh, to pick up languages. Uh, Stefan, would you agree that there are sort of uh, three ways for Norwegian artists for for income through um, public or local funding, arts council stipends and similar, through the art market sales and through public purchases. Yes. Approval and other. I think yeah. yes, and I think it's but I think it's crucial to uh, to uh, note that uh, for mo the vast majority of artists, it would be a combination of these. And then it would also be a combination of some income that you have outside of uh, yes, yes. So, and that's also a part of this uh, um, uh, being highly organized as artists and being cl closely tied to uh, policy that's based on uh, on surveys and uh, and uh, research from the artists. There are uh, artists' uh, surveys being conducted now. It's been around every eight years um, for for the past couple of decades and there is a new one coming out um, now they say in, in spring it's uh, completed i think from the research uh, uh, institute um, and it will show that uh, artists have and uh, in norway have uh, an uh, average income that's around uh, 300 uh, a bit more than 300 uh, uh, kroners or uh, 30,000 uh, euros per year um, and that uh, about a third of that is from like non-art related income um, so that could be odd jobs that you would have on, on the side maybe something that's flexible that uh, you could stop doing whenever you have an, uh, an exhibition and that is maybe also a crucial way for artists to set up um, for a young artist to get their practice going is to get into a position where you have uh, enough security that you can both continue your practice but also be flexible enough to use any opportunities that that come up um, and this uncertainty of course was something that was highlighted um, in very stark terms during the pandemic when this flexibility evaporated uh, and that's um, 
also very, I think, uh, telling for artists who don't have the opportunity to do this, uh, either for health reasons or it could be for artists who don't have a, a residency permit. So artists who are from uh, countries outside of the, the European um, economic area uh, who would need to apply for visas every year or uh, and uh, who have both quite uh, high income requirements that are above the average income for Norwegian artists um, generally, um, but also would have to specify where that income comes from, who are put in a, in a very um, difficult uh, situation compared to uh, Norwegian colleagues or European, uh, European colleagues working in Norway. Absolutely. I just, um, I think I'm going to open up for questions. I'm just going to briefly show you, if you see my screen now, that's on visp.no, um, on the resources. Uh, again, with the places you showed earlier, Stefan, yeah. you could go here um, and look for, say, um, galleries, spaces at festivals in, you can go to like Eastern Norway. It's all in uh, Norwegian, so you just have to, if you're non-Norwegian speaker, you just have to assume uh, what these things are, and then you can press it. I hope this link works. It does, excellent. But yeah, this is, uh, this is a tool for, not only for members, but for non-members, if they want to go into, uh, to have a look at overview over the Norwegian art scene. There's also organizations like uh, Bono and, uh, Landsforeningen Norske Mala, all these type, type of different organizations. There's a, um, there's a big, um, a huge forest of arts organizations in Norway. Let's see if there's a question here. Yeah. There's, no, so, there's also a Norsk Kunstavok, Norwegian Art Yearbook, is a bilingual publication that existed since 1992. It's a good uh, way to get to know the Norwegian art scene as well. And Christina, I don't know if you can read this um, in the chat, Stefan. Yes, I can read it out uh, here. Would you say that the art scene is also accessible for artists and creatives outside of Norway or people living in Norway without having Norwegian nationality? Uh, are there many projects in collaboration that you see happening? Um, and yes, would be the... First answer to that, I think this has been one of the uh, largest changes of the art scene in uh, the past couple of decades. Um, and I think this has been, this is a way that uh, we as artists have been more closely drawn together globally, um, but maybe especially uh, in, in Europe through both like partnerships and collaborations between institutions. But uh, also maybe partly through uh, cheap uh, air travel, which I guess we can start feel more guilty about now, but I think uh, has played a big part in, uh, it did play a big part in setting up 1857 as a very uh, low, low cost, low budget international uh, art space. And uh, there are of course a number of these art spaces around the world that uh, uh, create, has created networks of uh, uh, artists across borders. Um, there's more for those who want a really deep dive into the um, into the workings of the Norwegian art scene. There's uh, uh, an art history written by uh, Jonas Ekeberg, uh, who now works at the Arts Council, called Post Nordisk, um, that makes the case that uh, the development of the Norwegian art scene from, especially from the 90s onwards, was driven by the Nordic collaboration that sort of came came before this European or global collaboration through uh, Nordic uh, um, institutions uh, as the what's it called Ministerråd etc. Where where the Nordic countries, including the Baltics, have uh, various uh, support schemes for mobility and uh, project support. Um, of course, the difficulty in I can say how accessible this is, is that as, as this presentation that I've given now, it's a uh, very like layered of different institutions that have different, uh, wow. different remits and uh, different histories and different mandates. Um, and in order to 
know how to navigate this. I'm sure that's the same in Romania as well, that uh, some local knowledge or sort of getting, being educated or being sort of naturalized into this uh, does give you a big advantage in understanding what you're up to. Uh, but I think there is a, a there is a, always a high demand both for collaborations that go across uh, fields, so be, across different art forms and across uh, borders. Uh, there's also always a big interest, both from audiences and from uh, other artists, and maybe crucially from funding bodies to make those happen. Can I also add that um, uh, in the art academies, there's there's an art academy in Trondheim, Tromsø, uh, Bergen, and Oslo, and um, there's a very sort of international uh, group of uh, students uh, okay. and high high standard of of teaching and uh, and so on. Also, there's no tuition fees, which is a big, especially to towards compared to Britain, for instance, there's no tuition fees. Maybe um, here's worth also noting that uh, uh, I mentioned these barriers to visa and residency permits for uh, non-European um, or non-EU um, uh, artists. And now there's a new, it seems to be a new law coming into place that would uh, put tuition fees also on non-European uh, students in uh, higher education uh, in Norway including the art academies. So there would be no tuition for Norwegian students or for Romanian or European students. Uh, but a lot of this internationalism or this uh, global perspective that has uh, existed in the art academies in um, Norway up until now is uh, really threatened by this uh, new proposal of uh, tuition fees. I see. So that's a, that's a concern these days. To end, <laughs> maybe we should find a happy question to end on. I also want to say that this. Um, uh, I spoke to this Welsh artist, and I said, "What is it like for you coming from from Britain to to Norway with the um, expenses? You know, being more expensive." But she said that she once got a once she got a job in a cafe. She the, the pay is, is decent, you know, so she mm. could live off that and still study art. Hmm. Yes, are that's there... also another non-European. There's uh, maybe for if there are any non-European artists uh, looking to set up in Norway, I would recommend the um, support network Verdensrumme, um, who, which is uh, not an organization as such, but a mutual support network of artists who are facing both uh, visa challenges and and uh, and other challenges to um, establishing oneself as. Uh, artists in Norway. Yes, um, are there any more questions? I have put some um, some links in the in the chat for some websites and so on. Um, Christina, any questions from from the Romanian jury? Well, I just want to first thank Stephen a lot for the presentation. And uh, yeah, I was also looking and I am encouraging everyone, please, if you have a question, we have Stephen here with us and not every day. So just please shoot it in the chat. Um, of course, this was a brief introduction in the scene that you, I mean, for the ones who are not from Norway, might not know so well. For me, definitely it was full of... Um, new names and new insights so I was just from my side I was a bit curious um, to know a bit more not to take the time so if there are questions just please drop them there and I will just ask this one um, about the artist run spaces because you were talking about the artist run space that you you had and uh, because I think in Norway, the system is in such a way that the, the um, institutions and all the um, public bodies are very well organized. Uh, I think that this might lead to fewer artist run spaces, but I don't know if that's true. And I mean, how do they situate themselves in relation to the other uh, institutions? 
because for example, here the artist run spaces are very present and one of the core things of the scene. And I don't know, I was curious how that works because also in the beginning of one's career, like an artist might start with this to have an artist run space. It's something that he or she might think of. And um, just if you can a bit elaborate on that. I think there's a tradition, it's a, a presentation or a historical presentation in its own right to talk about the artist run spaces in Norway, but I think there's a strong sense of tradition, maybe coming from the 90s, I'm not really sure about the, um, I'm not sure, sure about the origins here, but, but that there is a sense of this is something that you are in a way supposed to do as an uh, art, young artist either recently graduated or seeing to, seeking to establish yourself, that to uh, uh, either set up an artist-run space or to exhibit in one or to help uh, making one happen is, uh, is the way to uh, both form a community around yourself and, uh, and, uh, to, um, and to make your projects happen in a way. Because even though there are a lot of institutions, there are still more artists um, uh, than than there are than there are institutions, um, and also this there's this social function maybe that the artist run spaces uh, do feel that they they can both be um, institutional in the sense that they do have an audience they do in a way break break barriers or showing something that's new or avant garde or some like developments in the arts. But you also have this important function as a sort of extension of the studio or a place where you meet and you and you hang out, which is uh, something that artists working by themselves in the studio uh, always want. This is uh, this is like the there are the two parts of the artist run space. It's the art that's uh, on the wall, and then there's the lukewarm free or cheap beer that you share with your friends. And uh, I think they're both uh, equally important in uh, making the scene happen. Great. Yeah. Um, you can, um, if people have some more questions, do you want to put your email in the, uh, the chat, Stefan? Yes. That's okay with you? Um, I don't think there's more questions, um, but um, yes, thank you yet again, Stefan, for a very good presentation. There's, um, it's funny, there's so many things we could talk about. But it sounds... yeah, there's a long, uh, it's, uh, it's like a tall order to give an sure. overview over the whole art scene. And then you go come and say that you have the whole list already made out. So but maybe I'm glad that I didn't... Uh, just read all the names I could think of aloud, um, which could also be yeah. 90 minutes. But uh, also people can contact, uh, I'll put my email here, this, if they have any questions uh, about the Norwegian art scene. Um, otherwise you'd find this um, information on uks.no or visp.no. Um, I just want to say um, thank you to everyone participating. Thanks to Christina, uh, Andrea, and um, Sector One Gallery, Stefan Honlicken from UQS. Um, and uh, any any last words? Not not for <laughs> just for today, basically. Great talking to you. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for everyone for for joining us. And take care and have a wonderful Christmas time. Thank you. Bye.